first female black orthopedic consultant in this country. Uh, but with it comes a great sense of responsibility. I uh, want to make sure that I do my job well so that those coming after me uh, can have a, a, an easy path where it can be accepted that a black female can be a consultant. And also I think it's very important to be a, a role model and visible role models are important. From age seven, I've thought, look, I want to be a doctor, but I said a surgeon uh, when I grew up. And so I always worked towards getting into medical school. And uh, once I got to medical school, I was quite enthusiastic about all different subspecialties. At one point, I wanted to be a cardiologist, I wanted to be a psychiatrist, but eventually I came back to surgery. The best part about being an Samantha Tross, I'm a consultant orthopedic surgeon uh, specializing in treating conditions of the hip and knee. I'm one of a very few women who are consultants within my surgical field. Orthopedic surgery is the surgical specialty with the least women. Uh, and, and so I'm, I'm proud to be one of those. So, um, so for you growing up in Guyana, what was it like growing up in Guyana, especially in terms of your environment? Did you enjoy it? Was it a nice time? Mm -hmm. Is it something that you look back and realize that it's built a very good foundation for yourself? Yeah, I, I think uh, I'm very lucky to have grown up in Guyana. Um, Guyana is a country in mainland South America, but more of a, sort of aligned with the Caribbean community rather than the South American countries. And the population of Guyana prim primarily Asian and Afro-Caribbean, uh, with a very few percentage of other people. And at the time when I was growing up, it was black people, primarily the party that was in power, that consisted primarily of black people in positions of authority. And so around me, there were numerous examples of very successful people. And I never felt there was anything that I couldn't do. Uh, also, my parents were very supportive, um, very keen on um, instilling in me the, the importance of hard work. And also that uh, education was a key to success. That was, that was their feeling. And, and as a child growing up, we felt that, um, well, we got the impression that our parents wanted us to, to follow certain career paths, although nothing was enforced. And I think that was typical of many Afro-Caribbean countries in the t at the time. You know, you're going to be a doctor, lawyer, engineer, accountant, that sort of thing. Uh, and luckily, I, I, I came up with the idea all, all by myself, and I decided I want to become a surgeon. Okay. And um, in terms of your schooling, how did that have an impact on you? What was school like growing mm. up? School was a very... It was strict, but you see, that, it, that suited my personality. So we would start off in the morning and you'd have to sing the national anthem or the national pledge to give you a sense of, you know, um, well, you know, be proud of your country. So that, that, was, that was important. Um, but also it, we, we, we were told that there were certain high standards that we had to meet. I mean, you had to, that was the, the year of the, the time of the cane, I should say, uh, and a corporal punishment. And, and you had to succeed or else you were punished. Uh, and, and that, of course, when I, when I speak to some of my siblings, my sister, for instance, felt that that actually hampered her learning. Um, just the fear of being cane, that stopped her learning. Whereas for me, that made me excel. So for me, I, I, I enjoyed being in school in Guyana. Okay. Yeah. Is, did you feel that it's like, a, um, you see, like, with, with that being a, um, a factor, like the cane, you, you thought it was a motivator? Yeah. Okay. It was, yeah, but my sister said, oh God, it really hampered her learning, so she hated it. I think my brother also, my older brother, but I, for me, it was like, I think, you know, I think, guess some kids are naturally competitive or not, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I that, that competitive streak is there. And I, I wanted to excel, I want to do, you know, and I certainly don't want to get keen, and certainly not in front of people. They, they were actually the two top guys in the class that I quite, I quite liked. And I wasn't going to be keen in front of them, you know what I mean? So these were my motivators, so. Yeah. Um, so I know I'm skipping a big, a yeah. kind of big chunk, but at the age of eleven, you migrate to mm. the UK. Mm. But before that migration, what do you? When you, I'm kind of trying to combine the two. Yeah. Arriving in the UK, what did it make you realize that you kind of lost? Because um, what a lot of people talk about is that when they migrate, they realize that I don't even know my next door neighbors, or there's not so, so much a sense of community. Is there certain things that you particularly missed when you left? Guyana? No, when I left Guyana, no, what, what I missed was my friends, and I missed my parents because I came here to boarding school. Okay. So it's not a, a typical just some sort of migration story. I was separated from my parents, I was separated from my culture, uh, and, and it was very traumatic. 
Um, so in terms of that sense of community, yes, I lost that. And I, what I missed was I missed, I missed being with people that looked like me. Um, and I missed, I suppose, the support of my parents. Mm. Mm. Okay, so um, I remember you say you're talking about you, like your first day at school, mm. and what are your you have vivid memories of that? Oh place. yeah, that was, what was that like? Yeah, so uh, as I said, I came over here and I went to boarding school, and myself, my older brother, and younger sister, we all went. So I was 11 at the time, my sister was nine, and my brother was 13. And the boarding houses, with that particular school had boarding houses and you were separated in the boarding house according to your age. So all of us were in different houses. So we didn't even have each other there to support each other. But, I, but it just so happened that my brother and sister, their boarding houses were adjacent to each other. So at least they got a chance to see more of them, more of each other. My house was, a, my boarding house was a completely opposite end of the compound. Okay. So I was very isolated. And um, whilst my house mistress, I believe, you know, I, I mean, like, I don't think of anything negative. I think people were kind, but on the first day of school, I mean, you know, I'm in a different culture, I'm in a different a place, I don't know, I'm, I'm 11 years old, and I was sort of pointed in the direction of where to go for school. There's no one even sort of like took you by the hand and took you to school. So I was, you know, go up the road and, you know, you're finding class. And as I got into the compound, you know, the first day of school, people are arriving and there's all this excitement and kids are running from all directions. And I found myself just surrounded by swarming kids. And I just felt completely lost in that moment. Um, and I, you know, I, I, I fell along in a heap crying. Mm -hmm. But then I cried for a few minutes and I thought to myself, well, this is not going to help you, you know. So I kind of got up, dusted myself off, asked where my class was, went to my class. I don't think I cried again. Okay. Yeah. Just from listening to talk, uh, talk at Vera Curious events, I feel that's something that you've carried throughout your whole life. It's kind of a thing where you're solution orientated. You don't Very really, much. you don't really reflect too much. You just want to I get just, on and you want to repair and that's ascend. It. That's okay. me. That's my personality. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So yeah. one thing that I've heard you talk about before is that even though you was in this environment that was unfamiliar. Boarding school did help you develop a number of skills. And mm. what, what do you think boarding school gave to you in that in that respect? I think you know board, boarding school um, made me become very independent, self reliant, and um, yeah, I guess, I guess strong emotionally. Mm. That, that that that's what you know. There, there was no one else to, to to motivate me in terms of study. The fear of my parents and the fear of disappointing them, that was all, that's always there that I carried in. I knew the expectation of my parents and that would drive me in terms of study. But essentially I was there on my own and I had to get on. That, that was my feeling. I'm alone, there's no one here to support me, I've got to just get on and do it. Um, and, and at the time it might have been miserable in part, but on reflection now I realize where, you know, the skills that I have, where I am, I am strong. I, I, I rely on myself a lot of the time. It, it, you know, it's, it's a positive and it can sometimes be a hamper because there are times when you need to reach out and, and actually rely on others and sometimes it involves teamwork and I'm very much have a tendency to try to do it by myself mm -hmm. and you know there are times when that can become exhausting. Mm -hmm. So, so there are, there's a positive and negative side to it, it's just getting that balance but certainly I would say those are the three fundamental things, you know, self-reliance, emotional, st mental strength I would say and um, what was the third one I said? Um, I'm so I was self reliant. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, um, do you feel that as time has gone by, you've developed that network that you need when you do need it, and then you? Oh yeah. I mean, an another thing I would say, which I think I developed at school, is the ability to get on with other people because you have to. <laughs> you're there by yourself. You're you're people of different cultures, and you have to to be able to communicate. Um, and, and I think that's, that's a, one of my good skills, is I, I can get on with people. So that, that's another important skill that I learned in boarding school. Okay. So uh, how well did you actually do in boarding school? Well, I, I, was very, I did very well. Um, being competitive as I was, I, I was either first or second in class. I think when I first arrived, I was, I was really second, because there were certain things I'd never done before, like French, and you know, I hadn't learned that in Guyana. And I remember the first term, I think I was near the bottom of the class, and by the second term I was second in the year in, in French. So, you know, it, to me, my, my whole drive is always to succeed and to be the best. Um, and so I, I was very good at the academic side of things, but I was also good at sports. Um, and, and so I did a lot of hockey and um, a lot of athletics. 
and I was um, national champion in the hundred uh, at the in long jump, and I rec I I, I um, oh the words escape me. I um, ran for my school um, in the hundred two hundred and long jump, and I won at the independent schools competition. And because I won that, that's how I was put forward to the to national champions championships for the West Midlands, and then I won the long jump. Do you, do you yeah. still have an interest in athletics today at all? Or? I do. I love to watch it. Mm. I wish I, I could say I was more sporty and doing more. <laughs> I mean, I, the best I do is try and walk up and down these stairs, you know. <laughs> but I don't do m much sport at the moment. And mm. I, I think as, as I get older and start to get a bit, of, get, get a bit stiff, mm -hmm. I think I should really perhaps pull my finger out a bit more. Okay. <laughs> yeah, even though you did do well, I think it was a very interesting story that you talked about where you had the great dilemma before. Oh yes, it. yes, that was interesting. So, <clears throat> so I did very well at school, mm -hmm. and but you know the, the boarding school environment is a very confining environment, and you know at weekend you're stuck in school. There's not much you can do. So um, I decided I didn't want to stay at school past my O levels. You know I wanted to leave school at that point. And by this time I'd done very well. I was I was a prefect, and you know I'd become form captain and all these things. And in fact, the headmistress wanted to put me forward for head girl, but I went. I left. I decided I had enough. And so now going to college, um, and this was college in Birmingham. My mum at that point came to live in the UK, um, and now having that freedom of being able to go out, and so I started partying and trying to enjoy myself because I'd been in that sort of very rigid environment for such a long time. And um, unfortunately, when it came to doing my mock exams, I didn't do very well. I mean, I was I was still very focused on getting to medical school, but I was I was you know. Got a bit distracted, and so I my, my grades were, were were not what they should have been, and um, when it, when it came to my um, form teacher sort of putting down predicted grades for my medical school examination, I knew that I wouldn't get in if he put down what I actually achieved, <laughs> and so um, I kind of locked him in a room and wouldn't let him out <laughs> until he <laughs> until he agreed to to write the the correct predict. But I mean that was like an hour of me really pleading, and he said, "Jesus Christ, man, you know." If you're as good as doing the exam as you are at, at pleading your case, I, I think you do well. Uh, yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> okay. So, um, mm. well, where did you did you actually do, do a bachelor's or did you go straight on to medical school? What happens after? Yeah. So in the UK, you go to medical school from your A levels. Mm. Generally, you can come in as a late entrant after doing a first degree, but generally most people go from the A levels. So I went and I did a bachelor of medicine and surgery and that's straight after A-levels. And then whilst you're in medical school, you have the opportunity to do an intercalated Bachelor of Science degree on top of your medical degree in, in certain subjects. Um, and I chose not to at that point. Um, I, I think I was in such a rush. I just don't want to be a doctor. I don't want to keep studying. You know, how is this going to help <laughs> me? And, and, I, and on reflection now, there is no need to rush. Um, and in fact, the doing an intercalated degree helps you more develop a more scientific and um, a sort of questioning mind and, and a research analytical mind um, which is always an area that I think I've struggled with uh, because I didn't do any research or anything like that um, and, I, and I and so this is what I tell the junior doctors day today that not to rush you know what's a year at that time it seemed like a hell of a long time um, but, I, but I didn't do that so I just had a bachelor of medicine and, and surgery and um, what did you most enjoy about medical school in general? What were your favorite things about medical school? I always liked the hands-on stuff, you know. That's why I guess I, I became a surgeon. It was very natural to me. Um, I enjoyed patient interaction, which I still do uh, tremendously. And I enjoyed the surgical aspect. So whenever I went to go and assist my, my superiors in theater, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And that's why I thought it would be for me, mm -hmm. you know. And, um, it, it, like you had a particular enjoyment about anatomy. Was yeah. What was it about anatomy that is it just seeing the foundation of what you were doing or? Yeah, I I don't know. I just I just found it easy. I I I was interested to know how you know understand the body, the human body, you know where muscles attach, what are the relationships to nerves and blood vessels, major structures and so on. And I I was interested in it. And because I was interested, in it, it became easy. Okay. Yeah. What is it that you? I know you said mentioned hands-on patient interaction, but orthopedic, ortho, to become an orthopedic surgeon, what was it that, I know you talked about it being mm. the first woman that you saw as mm. a doctor was an orthopedic surgeon, would you mm. say that was the core thing or do you think there were other elements that 
Well, you know, I was always going to be a surgeon. Probably at age seven, I said to my father, I'm going to be a surgeon when I grow up. Now, I don't know. I didn't say doctor, which I think is very unusual to say I'm going to be a surgeon. It was very specific. I don't know where that came from. But nevertheless, I had that idea in my mind that I was going to be a surgeon. It's only later on, when I got into medical school, I started being exposed to different specialties. And I then considered other things, psychiatry, cardiology, you know, and so on. And then <clears throat> once we got into surgery, I was exposed to different types of surgery. So it was general surgery, vascular surgery, which is a surgery of the blood vessels. General is mainly the bowels. Neurosurgery, which is brain surgery. Uh, and orthopedics, which is bones and joints and, uh, and associated tissues. And I chose orthopedics for several reasons. One, I think the, the orthopedic surgeons were the nicest. And, you know, just being around people who enjoy the job and, and don't mind having you around has a big impact, you know. The other other surgeons, I kind of felt like we were like a spare part of, or a nuisance at, at, at worst, getting in the way, whereas the orthopedic surgeons were accommodating. So I think that that, that was definitely important. Um, as I said, the first female surgeon I ever saw uh, was an orthopedic surgeon, so that had an impact, undoubtedly. Uh, and then the, the actual specialty itself, the fact that you can treat the young and old, male and female, and that the patients get better quickly because they have a sick body part rather than them being sick themselves. And, and I think that's something that aligned with my personality. I quite like, a, I think if anything goes on for a long period of time, I get distracted, you know? So, so I like the fact that in orthopedics, you can treat someone and they get well and they get better. So, so all of these factors are which influence me. So um, one of the interesting things, and one of the things I like about you is that you're very determined and you know where you want to go. Mm. I think, one of the experiences that probably shaped the, the way you the, the direction you've gone is you talked about your first exam i think it was your first exam where you experienced self-doubt and from then you said to yourself that you were never going to doubt yourself again mm. can you talk a little bit about that and what what you went through in that particular situation yeah well i mean obviously there were areas of doubt um when I did my A-level mock exam and, and you know, the, the, the grades weren't satisfactory, so that, you know, um, concerned me a little bit. But, I, you know, I, I don't think I ever really doubted that I had what it took. So that's why I was able to persuade my um, form master to get me in. Medical school, everything seemed to be going well until I came for my surgical exams. So the medical school final exams, that was all right. But when it came to surgical exams, um, this is when I decided to specialize as a surgeon. Here is when doubts start to creep in because I'm entering a specialty that doesn't have men, women anyway, and I'm here now as a black woman. So then, the way that people are interacting with you, although I said the surgeons were nice, that's when I was a student. It's a different thing when you're a student. Now you're actually in the game. You're actually one of the trainees, and 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 you people are treating you a bit more harshly than they would. Uh, other people, you know. So this is when seeds of doubt start to creep in, and and they'd say things like, "If you got something wrong, oh, you never pass the exam if you can't even get this right, or whatever." So, when people speak to you in a negative manner, that can allow seeds of doubt. And so, it, it, what happened over a period of time was I actually felt the exam was bigger than me. It's something that that it was beyond my grasp. And once that set in, you know, I went to the exam, and I can say I failed myself. Because when I was in the exam, it's, it's funny how you, 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 you're there and you, you're going through it, but it's like you're having an out body experience and you're watching yourself go through it. And even though you should try and change it in the moment, I couldn't change it, but yet I, was, I had the, the clarity to see that really it wasn't the examiner, but it was me. Um, because they weren't unfair or whatever. I, I, I think they treated me quite well in the exam, but I just suddenly, I just couldn't deliver. I froze. I froze because I didn't believe in myself. But then once I got out of the exam and I reflected on it, I thought, actually, you're more than capable of doing this exam. There was nothing really difficult. And then I went back and the second time I did the exam, only three months later, I enjoyed it. I thoroughly enjoyed it. So much so that at times, the examiners, they ran out of questions and we just sat and looking at each other waiting for the bell to go. <laughs> you know, it was, a, it was a totally different exam just because I had the right frame of mind. Yeah. Um. How important was a support network in medical school in terms of maybe academics or maybe just having to talk to someone about something that might not be even related to your academics? Um, mm. Did you develop, did you have mentors or anyone of the academic? I, no, yes. So what, what, a couple of things. 
when I went to medical school, I stayed um, in, in International Hall, which is um, a student accommodation in Russell Square, Brunswick Square, just off Russell Square. And I chose that because it was called International Hall, where I thought I'd meet people from different cultures, which was, was great. And it so happened that a friend of mine that I'd befriended the year before in Trinidad came to the same hall of residence. So I had, and then there were some other girls from the Caribbean, so we formed a West Indian Caribbean society. So, and I did most of my socializing at university with them. I don't think that I, I, I did very little with actually friends from medical school. I didn't really socialize with my medical school counterparts. I had my own cult West Indian support network. I mean, I made, I made some friends obviously in medical school, but most of my socializing was outside. So I had that, and the wider Guyanese community who by then I, you know, I developed that. Yeah. Okay, so, um. We did have a buddy system. So at UCL, because I went to University College, um, uh, first year of the joint school between University College and the Middlesex School of Medicine, and what they did was they had a senior assigned to you to sort of be a mentor or whatever. I didn't really, I mean, basically all my mind did was try to sell me all his books and then stuff like that, you know, just like, here, here are these books you need to study, and that was it. So there was no, but, but at least they put something in place. Uh, but I don't think that, that was particularly useful for me. Um, but th that, that's a start. And I mean, now, of course, they do have proper uh, career advisors and so on, which, which weren't really in place at that time. I had two fantastic mentors throughout my career. Mm -hmm. Two men who just took me under their wing. Um, and I, well, I say two. Um, yeah, I mean, Professor Fred Heatley and uh, David Lightoller, but there's also Richard Earlham. So there were three men. And Professor um, Fred Heatley was the, the head of training for orthopedics. And um, I think he saw, he recognized, I think he, he, he took time to get to know all the trainees. And he knew where your weaknesses were. And he knew that I had perhaps some self confidence uh, issues. Um, which when I was young I didn't, but that, that came on over time. And he would write ahead, because every year you'd move from hospital to hospital, and he'd write ahead. And I only found this out later on, and say that this young lady is coming to you, you know, th these are her areas of weakness, and you know, I want you to focus and support her in this way. So he, he did that, you know, and he did that for all his trainees. I wasn't, I wasn't special in any way, he did that for everyone. And that was important, and, and I felt he was there as a support. Um, um, Richard Earlham was someone I met when I first started my surgical training as I was going through general surgery. He was a general, although he was a general surgeon, he was there as a mentor for me throughout my whole career. Um, and he was, he was impressed by me when I worked for him and he liked me, which is, which is nice. And then the last one is, is, is um, David Lightoller, who was an orthopedic surgeon, one of the first orthopedic jobs that I did. And uh, he went on to become the president um, of the um, the Royal Society of Medicine, the orthopedic surgeon section and so on. And he made sure that he introduced me to people of significance within the orthopedic community. Um, and so, and I, and I had those guys support me throughout my career. So when you talk about the support, the support was there. And yet there were some people who were negative, but I knew that I had these guys in my corner and that was important. Okay. Yeah. Um, what's very important <clears throat> as well, you mentioned, I remember you talking about, like, I, I'll even be, I use my, I, myself as an example, um, when I've gone into certain arenas, I've always mm. liked to have someone initially to mentor me about certain things. Mm. And a lot of us in our community tend to go straight just to black people. Mm. But what was interesting is that these people weren't the same gender as you, no one was the same. same so it was interesting to hear you say that, as much as uh, if you can get someone that's from the same ethnicity, that is good. However, mm. their mentors come in different shapes, different forms, different people. So Indeed. that was very interesting yeah. when you said that. Um, there was two things that you mentioned when I saw you speak. Mm. Um, it was that stuck out to me. It was what I thought was a nice story, even though it was you could see it as not being a nice story. It was the experience that you had in Australia, where the mm. gentleman was trying to get someone else basically to treat him. And also, I think it was not being paid during yes. training. Yeah, go. You um, really listened to this you, interview. Yeah, I did. I really took it in. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So. Yeah. So I mean, basically, the scenario is I, w I was in Australia. Um, so uh, as part of our training, 
we do six years once you decide to become you first of all go through training in different surgical specialties to decide which specialty you want to go into and once you've decided and in my case it was orthopedics I had to have six years of training and, and then um, after that we were also encouraged to go overseas to get ex extra experience in a specific area within that specialty and mine was hip and knee surgery and I chose to go overseas and one of the countries I went to was, was Australia and when I was there I was working within the private sector so you know over here a lot of the, the, the treatment over there is within the private sector pa patients have insurance and and so the mindset of a patient coming to see someone private is they're going to just see the person they've come to they pay to see i mean they don't want to see a student or whatever uh, and so this guy came in and and um i was asked to see him first of all by my consultant and um I, I, I mean, I, I suppose I can understand why he didn't want to see me. If he, if he, would he have behaved the same way to a white student? I don't know, but he, he certainly didn't want to see me, and he was very obstinate. Um, and everything I asked him, he, you know, he, he was he was rude, frankly. Um, but I just said no. Well, you know, at the end of the day, if you want to be seen today, this is the process. So you know, you can fight up all you like, but the process is you're going to see me, and then you're going to see my boss. And so he grudgingly accepted, and we, I started asking him questions, you know, very short, blunt answers, whatever, but I just kept going. And then I started examining him. And when I started to examine him, and I started to explain everything I was doing, and what, what are the potential things one could look for, and why it's not this, or why, and I mean, I, I just, a change came over him. Because I think that was the first time anyone had ever actually sort of spoken to him in such detail, and I explained what was going on. Um, and then, you know, so he, by the time my boss came in, he was very pleasant. And um, he subsequently wrote to my boss, just saying to the boss, you know, what a knowledgeable young lady I was and how kind I was and, and good with, 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 with him. And the boss was, was surprised and he, and he apologized for his earlier behavior in the letter, for which my boss was, was surprised because he didn't notice any tension when he came into the room. Um, because little did he know what took place in the first part. But, you know, you know I didn't take it personally. Um, I just decided, look, this is my job, I've got to do it, and, and, and if this man wants to be seen today, he has to comply, that's it. Placements, so you, is that something that still exists today, that you can go and do international placements? So you said oh that yes. You, you said that you went to Toronto, you went to Guyana, yeah. How, what was nice about going to Guyana, what was nice about Toronto and Australia? Yeah, yeah. So it's very much encouraged. So there, there are two times when you are encouraged to go overseas. When you're in medical school, you go and do what we call an elective, um, and that is to give patients, students, a broader knowledge. You know, you wanted to know about the healthcare system outside of the UK. I mean, you can do your elective in the UK as well, but it's just to broaden your horizons. You know. And, um, and also, not just about doing them the medical side of things, but learning with different cultures and so on, to make them more well-rounded individuals. So there's the elective side. I, I chose to go home to Guyana because although I'm from Guyana, I had left many years before, and I wanted to sort of reconnect with my own culture. And I, I thoroughly enjoyed that on a number of fronts because obviously I was back home, and I was able to see, my, see family. I, um, I'm just trying to think if my parents were there at the time. I don't think my parents were there. I stayed with relatives. Um, so it was, it was, it was a, 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 an opportunity to reconnect with, 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 with my culture. So that's why I thoroughly enjoyed that. Um, I saw um, what, what the, the, the effects of lack of funding, basically. Okay. You know? So the, there, were, there were lack of resources, uh, which I struggled with a little bit. Um, it was difficult to see. That's what in Guyana. So that was tough. And uh, I suppose that made me really appreciate what we have here in the United Kingdom. Uh, and then at the, the, another, the latter end where, where we encourage to go overseas is at the end of our training in our specific specialties. And that's still very much encouraged today. Cert, I can only speak for orthopedics, I can't speak for other specialties, but um, I, I believe that also occurs in other specialties. Yeah. Uh, you talked about the fields getting bigger and better because I think you, <laughs> I think you mentioned about um, colleagues saying that I hope no one finds a cure for arthritis. <laughs> but, <laughs> you were talking about how since you've started to now the field is getting bigger and better. In what ways do you think it's bigger and better and maybe has a stronger appeal to potential candidates who wish to become orthopedics? Mm. It's an ever evolving specialty. I mean, we're always looking for ways either to understand the, 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 the early side of things to prevent disease occurring, but also once disease has occurred to improve our treatments. 
Um, and so in terms of the things that I treat, I treat um, on the, with young people's sports injuries. Um, and also I, I, I treat uh, the LD patients arthritis. Well, for sporting injury, there's nothing we can do. I mean, it's just better education for people and, and how they carry out different activities and so on. Um, but for arthritis, uh, it, there may be things that we can do w through perhaps genetic modification um, that can prevent people for certain types of arthritis, not just the, the aging arthritis, but arthritis, arthritis essentially is just um, a, dis a destruction of cartilage. That's all it is. And then the subsequent changes that occur in the bone. And there are different processes that can cause that to occur. Uh, so, so through genetic manipulation, I should say, um, that is something that perhaps can be treated. Uh, and then there are other treatments that we can do if there's a small area of cartilage destruction to prevent it expanding. And better understanding the disease process, um, we can treat underlying cartilage conditions and so on. So, so that's why that, that's ever changing. And then on the uh, treatment side, for end-stage disease such as arthritis, we use prostheses. And we have to look at uh, making these prostheses last longer. And whether it is that the, the materials that we uh, explore, or also, I mean, in the future, what's going to happen is perhaps having a microchip inside the prosthesis that can detect changes in the microenvironment, either whether the, the prosthesis is starting to loosen or whether there's signs of infection. With infection, what happens is the pH will lower. So, so things like that, that's, that's the future. And then artificial intelligence, robotics, and so on. So it, it's forever changing, and, and that's what keeps it interesting. Okay. Yeah. And, um do you see it as a benefit or positive? Oh, do you see it as a, a positive that more and more technology is becoming involved? Because you talked about some of the new technical devices that computers are now being used, and some people are more traditionalists, and yeah. some people are, are for the machines. Yeah. Well, I, I think I think for the time being, man will still ha very much have an input in terms of doing these um, operative procedures. But that's not to say in the future that it won't be solely done by robotics. But at the moment, the robotics are there to aid the surgeon to be more efficient and to have more um, reproducible results. Uh, so I, I mean, I for one think that's, that's better. I mean, that's what we want, don't we? We want our prosthesis to be put in in the best way possible. And we want to have the best components, the best materials used um, so that they can give us a, the best outcome and last for as long as possible. There was a stat that you mentioned about women going from 3 to 12%, which is an increase in, mm -hmm. the, in that time frame. Mm -hmm. However, I'm sure that you would like it to be much more. Much more. Much yeah. more. How, how do we get women involved, black women involved, just people involved more more into uh, knowing about orthopedic surgery? How, how, how can we, what's one yeah. way do you think we could actually do that? I, I think it's, it's, it's raising awareness is, is, is the key and, and getting out to, to, to schools. Um, and I do a lot of mentorship work and I do a lot of inspirational talks and recently um, was involved in putting together a, a, an open day at Bristol University. It was in, in collaboration with the, the, the Department of Engineering um, and basically we opened it up to children from inner city schools uh, to come and, and, and see what, what, what's possible and I went along and talked about orthopedics and took orthopedic equipment and got them to come and practice putting in a hip replacement in, in, in a sore bone and that sort of thing. So it's, it's just let them know that, that that career is out there, that it's an option. Um, and then within orthopedics, there's so many different subspecialties. Like for instance, on, on one of the, and I went to another um, open day for young girls via the Aletta Foundation. And I was speaking to a young lady there and I asked her what she wanted to do. She said she wanted to be a midwife. And I said, oh, that's great. Why do you want to be a midwife? She said, oh, because I want to look after babies. And I said, well, why not, you know, be a neonatologist? Why not be a pediatrician, whatever? But those are things she hadn't ever considered because she didn't know about them. Mm -hmm. So because she liked treating children, she just immediately thought of midwife. And there's nothing wrong with being a midwife, but what we need to do is to expose them to what other things they can do for whatever particular desire that they have. So it's about raising awareness. Okay, so with all the hard work that you do, Dr. Ross, how does Dr. Ross relax? Okay, Dr. Ross is not very good at relaxing, right? I can tell you what Dr. Ross enjoys and what she intends to do more of in the future. So I, I, I really enjoy dancing, you know, I, I enjoy music, music in all forms. I mean, I'm kind of stuck in the 80s, <laughs> <laughs> uh, giving away my age there. Um, but I love music, I love dance, I like uh, theatre shows um, and I love to travel. Um, and probably best of all, I love to eat. Um, so uh, anything that's... Um, 
I love seafood and spicier the better. Um, yeah, and, 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 and you know, okay, eating is something that I, I, do, I do do a lot of, but all of the other things I probably don't do enough of. And um, I realize now the importance of looking after me so I can be more effective in looking after others. And so moving forward, I plan to incorporate much more of those things in my schedule. And do you get to go home often these days? I home? go every year because my parents are there. And as they get older, I, I, you know, it's important to them to see me. Because initially I probably went every couple of years or whatever, but now I'm making a point to go every single year. Mm -hmm. And um, in terms of, because you've gotten to such a high level, is there anything that you've seen that you would like to give back to Guyana? Or? Oh, most definitely. I, I'd love to be involved in Guyana on many fronts. Um, I have done um, an outreach program for Guyana where we went into the community and I mean that that was you know I can't even put into words how uplifting that was um, because with just a little you can you can actually have such a great impact mm -hmm. you know and these this was in the Amerindian community the Native American Indians and uh, we put on a clinic and some of them had walked for two to three days to come for the, to that clinic you know um, and yeah you didn't have to do much but but it was it was very interesting to see a lot of end stage disease which one would never see in England because we were treated much earlier so it was a, it was a learning experience for me as well but I'd like to do more of those and um, also I would like to uh, every time I go to Guyana I'm always bombarded with people coming to me with you know oh my god can you have a look at my x-ray or whatever um, perhaps set up some clinics out there and get involved in, in, in teaching um, the British um, The, the World Orthopedic Concern, um, which is a section of the British Orthopedic Association, um, has set up a degree sort of degree program in Guyana, uh, and, and, and with them I'm hoping to do some work. Um, and also, I, I, I feel this affiliation for doing something with children, and that's probably because I don't have children of my own. Um, I'd, I'd probably like to get involved in something to do with children, that's, that's just a feeling. Um, and perhaps working with one of the children's homes or something. But definitely I plan to give back. I plan to spend more of my time there. My ideal scenario would perhaps be a 50-50 or whatever. Six or six exactly. <laughs> yeah, working here and working there and getting into flexible contracts. I'm working on my people here to see if I can <laughs> <laughs> get that arranged. Okay. Yeah. Um, what, uh, just, um, I really could have asked this at the beginning, but um, yeah. what are some of your, to, actually to you, to some other people it may be, um, those things are big to them, but sometimes they're not big to you, or sometimes they are big to you. What are your biggest achievements and accolades for you that you've achieved? Because I know you've been recognised by your country of birth, obviously, that's why. Yeah, I mean... Because uh, obviously your intention wasn't to go out and get accolades, your intention no. was to go and help people. I know exactly. that, and that comes across, that comes yeah. to you straight away. Yeah. But what, what do you think, even if it's not an accolade, what do you think is the biggest thing for you? I mean, I think for me, the biggest thing for me is when I have an impact on a patient. Um, I, I get that feedback from them and that, that, that really ch impacted their life, you know. I, I don't think anything can actually top that. It's nice to have all the awards, but that's, as I said, that's what I set out to do. And that, that's what gives me a great reward. It's when I have a successful operation and I've impacted on a patient's life. And I, I think one other thing that, 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 that touched me was one of my colleagues, another orthopedic surgeon, asking me, to, do, to carry out the operation on his mother. I mean, because you can't get higher than that. You know, you, this is another surgeon. And he's saying, listen, of all the surgeons I know, I want you to operate on my mother. That's trust right there. You know, I, 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 for me, the, the, that's got to be the highlight. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, there'll be all the rewards, but you know, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, what would you say to your 11 year old self? Worry less. Mm -hmm. I'm a worrier. And I, I allow things to stress me. I don't, I don't show it externally. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's one thing. Because people always say, oh, you're always so calm. Even, I remember I go for job interviews. Everybody would say, oh, you're so calm in the waiting room or whatever. <laughs> when I'm, yeah. um, so I would say worry less. Be fearless. Be fearless. Yeah. And the last question is, what do you want your legacy to be? Um, I guess my legacy I'd like to be that young girls of colour feel that they could do whatever they whatever they want to. Um, I mean, part of the legacy has been opening the doors to other women 
because you know being the first uh, in, in in orthopedic surgery you now there there are three others um so that that has been as i guess part of my legacy was opening the doors both to to train us to see that you know it is okay for black women to come into the specialty and for other women to see that it's possible um but also just to, for, for all your girls whatever you want to do that you can go and achieve it